Hello and welcome to Serpent Temple. We have another special episode this week as me and Shem are going to do a deep dive into the death metal catacombs with two underlooked gems. First one being Disembowelment's legendary Transcendence into the Peripheral, released in 1993. And secondly, we've got Phlebotomized with their album Immense Intense Suspense, released in 1994. Yes. I am amazed I got through all of that without <laughs> fucking up a single I'm word. I'm impressed, man. <laughs> I should do this shit professionally. <laughs> right, so uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to give a bit of background information to people, uh, to the uninitiated, people that are not familiar with disembowelment. Uh, so they before are, we dive into that, Floyd. They are. Yes. How, how was your week? Oh, my week. My week was great. I went to watch uh, Ingested yesterday at the Underworld. I was coming home from work. Nice. And I saw the uh, saw their name up in the uh, the fucking the, the sign and I was just like fuck. Still had tickets, so went home, dropped my bag off and uh, listened to some slamming UK death metal yeah. for an hour. It looked sick, man. And yeah. it was sick. Yeah, it was, it was so good. And I was just saying before as well, like um I feel like the sound in the Underworld has been amazing the last few times I've went. Yeah. It's such a cool and intimate venue and it's like it's always much smaller than you remember. It's got that DIY feel to it. You could get up onto the stage really easily. Yeah, yeah. It's just such a fucking like cornerstone venue yeah. and like and then Jess, they're a great band. I think talking of underrated bands, I do think they are one of those bands that I feel like um probably should be more revered than they already are in the scene. I agree. Especially considering how much, you know, the UK's got such a rich history and tapestry when it comes to, you know, pioneering death metal bands. And I feel like they've done a great job and you're kind of like bringing slam into the UK scene. So that's what I was up to this week. And just enjoying the warm weather. It's been fucking oh. nice as hell. So good. What about yourself? Yeah, just the same, really. Just demoing. Just <laughs> all of my spare time is just working on the new Learn album. I love it though. It's, it's, yeah. it's great, yeah. And just yeah, I can't wait to hear it. It's yeah, gonna, yeah, yeah. It's, it's awesome. I'm really, really excited for everyone to hear it as yeah, well. I think it's going to be legit. But yeah, yeah. it's just oh, we were saying as well. It makes such a change to have nice weather in London, oh, man. Right. It's just I feel like a different person, dude. I know. It's so good. I just feel absolutely revitalized. Right, so we're getting to disembowelment now. This is a, this is an interesting band because um, am I right in saying you discovered them semi recently? Yeah, I'd never heard of them, yeah. ever. Uh, I think I heard of them on the Heavy Hole podcast. Yeah. Because I think I listened to um, the interview with Paul Rydell. Is it from... Uh, uh, Blood Incantation. Blood Incantation. And they briefly mentioned them there because he said, obviously, obviously their disembowelment are a huge inspiration on uh, Spectral Voice. Yeah. And they're one of the very key bands he like pointed out there. Um, and then I think it was like a separate episode. They had They played a little clip... Um, when they were doing their like recommendations and they were like, oh yeah, Transcendence of Britain. And there's just the little bit of music I heard. I was just like, what, what the fuck is this? Yeah. And I, <laughs> where, where's this been? And then I listened to the album and I, I think I listened to the album just nonstop for three days. <laughs> I just, it's amazing. It's one of those true, just like hidden gems of the scenes that like, it's the best feeling in the world when you discover an album that connects the dots between other bands. It's you're just like, oh fuck, this is where that came from. Like, you know, even listen to a band like, say, Bellwitch, for example, there's yeah. like certain moments in this album. I was like, ah, that's where they got their inspiration from. I could totally, and it's just, and I have to say that there's something about, this band's from Melbourne, Australia, and there's something about the Australian scene that I think has just always been a bit, a bit weird, a bit avant-garde, a bit out there. You know, bands like Portal, um, fucking like Blood Duster as well. Have you ever yep. listened to them? Just like fucking. Yeah, yeah. Paramecium. Uh, Paramecium, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> another like another, sick another underrated band. sort of doom death band. Um, but that's how I was going to go through the list of the band members. You've got Jason Kells on guitar, Paul Matsiota on drums, Matt Scaradu on bass. What a name. What a name. <laughs> <laughs> and Renato Galina on vocals, guitars, songwriting, and lyrics. Found um, a funny, interesting f uh, fact. Oh, let's hear when it. When I was Googling, doing research for this episode, I found out by accident when I was Googling Renato Galina, there's an NPC in World of Warcraft called Renato Galina. Is it named after... That's what so I wondered. I was like, maybe there's a because there's like uh, Cannibal Corpse references and yeah, stuff. Yeah, got isn't Corpse there? Grinder. Yeah, is, yeah, yeah. Um, so I wondered if there's right? like a guy in uh, who programs it, like World of Warcraft, that loves this yeah. embalment. Got to be right. There's so yeah. much crossover <laughs> between like yeah, it's interesting. World of Warcraft and metal. You think it's got to be. Mm. Um, and I think there's still Inverloc, the band that was kind of formed afterwards. They're still kind of active, aren't they? That's got um, <laughs> Paul and Matt in the band. Yeah. Oh, is it Paul and Matt? I thought it was the guitar. It would make sense. It was I think it's one. drums I'm and bass, sure. yeah. Okay. It's the rhythm section that formed that band. And they play. They do play some disembowelment songs live. Yeah, yeah. I've read them. not listened to their album or really delved too much into them, but I uh, keep meaning you know, to. I, you know, the problem is, every I, I've been meaning to do this as well, but every time I think about it, I end up listening to Transcendence <laughs> into the Peripheral. <laughs> 
because <laughs> it's just that good an album you can just listen to it over and over and over again it's just it is an amazing album so it was released on i don't know if it was originally released on relapse records yeah it was but was it they got the original... signed without having ever played a gig yeah, they got crazy. signed purely off the strength of the demos yeah i mean that is that's, 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 all really, that? <laughs> yeah. that's like it's like demolic tour in a nest by th- for uh, <laughs> 30 plus years yeah you know, disembowelment never played a gig ever really ever <laughs> that's crazy Renato Galina couldn't play guitar and play and sing at the same time. When oh, they recorded fuck. the album, he wasn't physically able to sing and play the guitar part simultaneously. Yeah, there's just something so kind of undeniably cult about that. There is like, <laughs> the fact that it's just that no one's ever seen him live. Just one <laughs> proper fucking album. Yeah. And it's just, but what album it is. I feel like what I'd like to do is go sort of track by track. Yeah, absolutely. And just kind of, uh, just kind of delve into it. I think the first thing that really hits me, so you've got the first track, The Tree of Life and Death. I think the first thing about the band that really hits you and makes you notice is is those really kind of like dissonant, like overall emotional leads. Like it's just the first time you hear it, you're just like, what the fuck is that? And I think it's just, I think this is probably one of the earliest like combinations of like death and doom, but in a way where it's not overly gothic. Because mm. you had like My Dying Bar- Bride, <laughs> My, Dying Bride. <laughs> My, Dying Bride. My Dying Bride, Paradise Lost. Anathema doing like you know the more the, the more gothic and romantically tinged like death doom combination. There is no romance. No, in this, like, about. There this is, is no just hope. Tr- fucking despair, pain, and despair. Yeah, there is nothing positive. <laughs> there's about two percent of this album where there's like a slither of hope in the music, and that is it. But it's um, but oh, what a fucking track to start with. I think um, one of the things that I really love. Um, about this band and what they do in, in their compositions is is the use of the double bass pedal in the music because they use it during like some of the more slower kind of like doomier riffs and it gives it this really like kind of almost random militaristic feel that yeah. really, and it's like and it's kind of it, it, it puts you on edge a little bit it does that's a really good observation 100% yeah I 100% agree yeah it's very unique to them yeah somehow in in all of the Death Doom ever, that like when I was that is something I picked up and listened to this album for the first time as well. The drums are super interesting. Yeah, because yeah, it's just like cause it's not formulaic because you're so you're so used to hearing you know you've got your your plodding four four beats during the Doomier bits and then you've got your blast beats and your gravity blasts in the death metal section. But that's not like this on this album. Like the drums are oh, they almost have like you know a will of their own and like but in a way that's not too disjointed. Like it's still coherent with the rest of the instrumentation. But yeah. it's totally fucking out there and just such a super interesting just album and this track i think um, all the tracks are great on this album you know i mean it's just uh, what i find interesting in particular um about this track is i think um just the, the constant pace changes as well there's a lot yes. of times where they just change the pace you know you've got like so five minutes 45 you've got like a really sick transition to like more of like a mid pace kind of groove it's quite easy to cut your head bang into. There's elements of funeral doom on here, yeah, like the classic, classic sort of like tremolo death metal riffing. Well, do Just... you know what's interesting? I was reading an interview with Renato Galina, he's a super interesting guy, and I'll get into it a bit later on. But like, he was like, What is funeral doom? Like, why do people call it funeral doom? Like, he was really like, he seemed to take umbrage with that term. Yeah. Which is super interesting considering just how fucking slow and heavy disembowelment yeah. are. Yeah. Like, I'm like, when I heard the funeral doom, I was like, oh yeah, that's a pretty good term. Like, when I first got into Ahab and it was described as funeral doom, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. But Actually, he hated it. But the thing is, that's, that must be where the etymology comes from, right? Just because it's just that little bit slower and more kind of morbid and depressing than the rest of it makes sense doesn't it It sounds like a funeral march which is a slow trudging thing yeah i actually think in terms of like genre like sort of like subgenre names i think it's one of the more apt ones personally like i think it (laughs) it sounds cool and like (laughs) even as like uh, even as bragging rights you know what sort of music are you into i listen to funeral doom yeah it's like what the fuck (laughs) yeah 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 yeah. it it sounds tight it sounds fucking dark and evil it sounds good yeah like grind like you say like oh i listen to grind like what does that mean yeah (laughs) yeah <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's is. like, well, what is grind? What Speaking is, of grind, grind, like it, it is. It's what I do like about this album is, you know, there is an element of grind at times, just in some of the riffs and riff, riffage and uh, some of the drum production as well. So it's like it's a real melting pot of sounds here, which is I think really belies the year it was released because like ninety so, ninety three, right? Ninety three, yeah. That is so. Uh, what effigy? Uh, effigy of the Forgotten's what two, three? Ninety one, I think. I was it ninety one. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. But it's, it's still super early, man. There's a lot of really key stuff comes out around 92, 93. Like those, that's the golden years, isn't it? 91 to 93 are the absolute 
peak yeah. of death metal. That's when it was like you could go to your local pub and they'd be playing. Everyone was playing death metal. Yeah. Everyone was got. It was like an arms race. Yeah. Everyone was trying to be faster and heavier, and you know, I don't know. I don't know what it was, but yeah, I guess, I guess, like people had got sick of all the glam stuff. Yeah. And like, yeah, there was just this nasty turn at the turn of the nineties. There was this yeah. thing of like. Because I guess when was grunge? That was pretty more mid nineties, right? Yeah, like early like, mid nineties. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, that's like, like everyone. Well, got never in... mind was what ninety one as well, right? I think. What was it? Was it well, maybe nineteen ninety. Let's have Google. Um, it's just it's interesting in the context because I remember I was listening to um, uh, it was Afterbirth were talking about on an interview once where they were saying they played a gig with like, damn yeah, it came out in ninety one. That's really interesting to think of that actually. So actually, this is after the the absolute. I mean, never mind. It was like the heyday, right? That was yeah. the absolute. It would have that album would have gone on for ages. But I remember Afterbirth saying in an interview that they played a gig with Dying Fetus and like in like New York around like the end of the death metal boom, and he yeah. said there was like eight people there. Yeah, and it was like Dying Fetus. Yeah, with like one of the most <laughs> yeah. iconic like yeah, seminal yeah, yeah. bands, from which the is genre. We- yeah, it's weird to think about now. Yeah. But he was like, yeah, just people just didn't give a shit. They just went from being rabid to it to like. Do you know what shit. I think happens? Because I feel like. Around about that time, sort of like 90 to 93, 94, let's say, um, that's where you had the genesis and the splintering of all the death metal and its subsequent subgenres. Mm. You had atheists going down the technical route that was also kind of pioneered by death before them. You yeah. had bands like Dying Fetus and Suffocation, like bringing the slams and the hardcore influence into it. Yeah. And then, so, and then, you know, you had like other bands, like you had your Disgorges and your Deeds of Flesh doing like the more brutal, kind of like semi technical stuff. Yeah. So it kind of was like, it kind of splintered off in like a shotgun effect. But I feel like it became so oversaturated that by the time of right. the end of the 90s, it was, there was so much shit out there. Yeah, maybe that was part of it. It's true. Yeah. Cause I, yeah. No, it's interesting. I think I always imagined that all this kind of stuff, the like 91 to 93 boom, I kind of imagined that Nevermind came out at like 95. I kind of thought of that like big grunge period as being the thing that killed it. But no, it's a lot, it's a lot more simultaneous. Yeah, it's Effigy of the it's Forgotten came out the same year as Nevermind. That's weird to think about to me. I was like, oh, of course. You think back and it's like, oh, Effigy of the Forgotten, this is this old, ancient, legendary thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But Nevermind came out the same year. It's like, ah, oh, that's really interesting. I think it's because I think it's because the, the staying power of Nevermind and the grunge scene is something that kind of like permeated the um, like the MTV and the, and the radio waves long after it was released. Like for me, like I always think like the year synonymous Maybe that's part with of Nirvana it, yeah. is always 94 just because probably the year he, he that's killed true. himself. But like, yeah, it probably crested yeah, yeah. more after then. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Because like I remember, I remember when uh, Kerrang! first launched and they'd done like their top like um, 50 songs of all time and like a number one was Smells Like Teen Spirit. And like I'm, I'm like most of the top ten, I think were grunge songs. I think, funny enough, they were pretty high on Marilyn Manson back then as well. <laughs> remember, remember the beautiful people being in the top ten. Yeah, yeah. And oh, it's but like, it it's was um, what's the album after Nevermind called? This is relevant. In we utero? are talking about this in, about, in utero. That's it. That's what I was going to look up. So obviously, the, Bleach was, was the first did, album right? that had Floyd the Barber. Yep, Floyd the Barber. Okay, yeah. In utero came out in 1993. Yeah, that was like yeah, like, right? yeah. That's a weird album. That's a really abrasive one. You could tell they were like a bit more influenced by kind of like Swans and Melvins. And yeah, yeah, totally. They were just like, nah, fuck that commercial shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I certainly respect. Yeah, but yeah. definitely. But, but okay, so back. So this album came out around the time in Utero, which is like they're try- they're trying to kill the 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 go- grungy's trying to kill itself. Yeah. And then this kind of sneaks in under the under the radar. This is like the dark underbelly, isn't it? It's yeah, like this is the like... things that are growing in the darkness. Yeah. And, the, and also, this is one of the darkest, most evil, heaviest records ever recorded. And 100%. yeah, they come from Melbourne. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sunny Melbourne, which I find amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's, you're right. And it goes back to the point I was saying earlier, but it's just like, you know, this is the first time for me where I listened to a Death Doom album that truly incorporated, like, you know, the the base elements of what the genres are named after like you know mm. it's got the raw death metal elements but it's 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 doom but it it sounds doomish in in the pure meaning of the word the like it just sounds sense. like pure yeah. misanthropy and doom and just grief and yeah and it, it just, is it, yeah it feels like that yeah it feels I, like there's emotions and it's like you know i got into this album at the right time because obviously i got into it a bit later maybe the early 2000s maybe about maybe 2003 or 4 because i just saw a lot of people speaking online about this album like wow. a lot of bands i liked you know legendary bands saying oh yeah, yeah and your disembowelment transcending the peripheral was such a like a, a seminal album for us and it's and i'm glad i did it that way because i felt like if i listened to this before i listened to say like 
suffocation, dying fetus or cannibal corpse, <laughs> I would not have been into this. Like my palate would have been totally turned off by this. But it also totally makes sense why you're not like such a huge like stonery doom type guy. Because I think I would have been the same. <laughs> like if you hear stuff like this and then you hear some of that stuff, it just seems like insincere by yeah. comparison. Yeah. Like this is so real. This to me is like pure, this is real art. Yeah. This is incredible. It's such a snapshot of the human experience. Yeah. It's such a singular thing. And like the, the tree of life and death. Another thing, there's lots of themes and I was looking into the, uh, I, first of all, like I started off with the impression of this album before we started reviewing it. I, I started off with my own personal impression of this album and I'd kind of looked in and read the lyrics, but I never really like deeply analyzed them before. Yeah. And I came away from looking further at it with a completely different view of the album, which is really interesting. Um, like the, there's a lot of like parallels in this, like the tree of life and death is like a very, so that's like Yggdrasil. That's like the tree. It's like this force that's outside of you. That's greater than you You can possibly understand. Yeah. But it's also a physical thing you can touch. Yeah. And in the, the lyrics for this song, um, it, it's also interesting because this album is kind of a bit like a, a concept album. Uh, a lot of the tracks seem to string together when you kind of look at it a certain way. But this one almost kind of stands apart from that. And I'm not sure if that's just because I haven't made the connection yet. Um, but the the really interesting thing is like there's there's a lot of talk of in the lyrics for this album. It's almost like it's like a lone figure. It's yeah. like Renato Gallina himself is like it's all very obviously deeply personal, I guess, for how he views things. And there are other people in in the lyrics, but they kind of all are kind of robbed of any kind of agency. He refers to like peasants yeah. a lot. Which is like, it's interesting to me because like reading the way the lyrics are structured, it's kind of almost like he's looking at society. Yeah. And he's kind of looking at these people that are like working, you know, working in the fields. And there's there's a lot of references to like more kind of classical, kind of older, kind of, yeah. there's nothing modern really yeah. like about the lyrics for this song, especially. Um and then he's kind it's like he's kind of like talking about like the relentless kind of churning of life and death and all this kind of stuff and it's very like gothic and spooky but then towards the end of the lyrics it gets to the bit where um is, where is it the priest where is it uh it starts with a bit oh i totally thought it was this one oh no you definitely need to look up the lyrics to this album because those yeah, fucking yeah. vocals are indecipherable yeah they're completely indecipherable they're fucking kind of, great though it's just yeah, like yeah 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 yeah, but they, he said, oh, that's it, a monk. It's not a priest. He says, now a disoriented monk, banished from the order, finds solace within the cold surroundings of the untouched ground. The secrets are revealed to him. It is who commands the living, the dead, the dead. And it's kind of interesting because it sets up this theme that plays throughout, because it's like transcendence is changing one, your, one state of being into another. And transcendence into the peripheral is like, is kind of like leaving your body and becoming part of the atmosphere. It's kind yeah. of what that means, right? And um, this first song, like the tree of life and death, it's kind of like anchoring you within the world. And then it comes to this person having this like awareness of like, it's like he becomes aware of consciousness beyond life. Yeah. It, and that's kind of like the tree and life of death, life and death is this like otherworldly force, which kind of represents that as this all powerful being, but it's also unknowable. Yeah, because it's a tree. <laughs> it's yeah. not a person, you yeah, know. Yeah, which is, yeah. I just find that really interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. I think, I think the whole kind of uncertainty about the afterlife is something that is kind of reflected quite well in the music here. Because mm. I just think, you know, because whether or not there's something more, it's just kind of like this unending warm darkness. I think you could. I think different people are going to take different things from that. I think a lot of people, some people, find a lot of comfort in knowing that that it's just the end, and it's yeah. just permanent kind of like whereas others i feel like you know so a lot of people so desperately want to cling on to the idea that there is a and to, to, to coin a term of a band we've been talking about already like a nirvana where yeah, you yeah, like yeah. just reach this you know this state of just constant euphoria well that's um, that's funny sorry i didn't mean to cut in sorry but yeah but you know that they, they could be one and the same it's yeah. you, know, you don't know well you know like the the buddhist concept of hell is samsara which is reincarnation and uh, of, yeah. Oh, yeah, so, that, yeah, yeah, I didn't yeah, know. Yeah, that's what Samsara yeah. is. It's like the idea of like when you die, you come back to Earth and you're reincarnated because you haven't learned all the lessons you're supposed to have ah, learned okay. while you're on Earth. Yeah. And it's like you haven't got it yet. So yeah. you've got to go back and try again. Yeah. Um, and Nirvana is when you attain that part of being where you transcend yeah. into the peripheral. Oh, nice. That's go. what Nirvana is. Yeah, yeah. Which is super interesting. But they don't make a direct relation to anything like that in the, the lyrics nah. of this album, not in that way anyway. 
Um, and another really interesting thing um, I found like uh, there's a review, an uh, interview with machinemusic.net. I couldn't figure out how long ago the interview was because the, the, the date of when it was was in Hebrew and I couldn't translate it. And oh, it okay. looked like it was like, it could have been two years old, but it also could have said more than two years old. So I'm not sure exactly when yeah. it was. Um, but it seems to be an interview with Renato Galina now. Yeah. Like he's older. And it's like they're asking him, and it's from what I can see, it's like one of the only interviews with him as yeah. well. Um, it's, it's it's very interesting. Um, but one one of the things he says directly um, was that when they set out to make the album, they very consciously wanted to include new wave influences. So that's where a lot of the like clean guitar, the discordant kind of noises come from. Okay. Is that he was inst- they were inspired by bands like. Um, they were inspired by bands like, uh, oh God, She Sells Sanctuary, The Cult. Yeah. Um, yeah, like new wave bands, post-punk bands, things like, I think he referenced like Slow Dive. Like Killing Pete. Joke maybe? Or? Yeah, I don't think he said Killing Joke, but yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. literally like that, all that new wave stuff. There was like a huge list of bands and he was like, I want to be like that. But also he was doing things like, yeah, like, um, oh my God, I'm completely tanking this bit. But yeah, you get the idea. You yeah, know, yeah. Just lots of kind of like, yeah, lots of like... Um, like reverb soaked guitars like they went into this album no, he had a very clear image yeah. that that was what he wanted to do and he wanted to juxtapose the sheer heaviness of the heaviest guitars you could do with this well i think that's like one of the usps of the album right it's because totally. you've got this crush and heaviness because there's some like because the most of the rhythm guitars right are down are down tuned super low yeah and like and the bass has got a massive amount of low end <laughs> and like also the drums are, are like they're very organic sounding. But they sound like a pistol a lot yeah, of the time. They sound like a gun. Brutally produced. Like yeah. They're really militaristic. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so it's just, yeah, it's that juxtaposition because like when the cleans and some of the leads come in, like it's just, it, it really takes you off guard. And like in the second track, um, your prophetic throne of ivory, uh, there's a, there's a couple moments that really remind me of uh, Frederick uh, Thordendal from um, oh, okay. uh, Meshuggah. Yeah, like yeah, there's yeah. some like kind of yes. almost jazzy yeah. like clean yeah. breaks. I'm thinking, God, this is just it's just so fucking interesting. And this is why I love doing like deep dives, because it forces me to listen to the album again and pick out on things that that I don't necessarily pay attention to when I listen to the music. That's that's a really spot on observation. I didn't actually make that connection, but now you say that, I'm like, oh yeah, absolutely. And it's this thing they do. They 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 do a re- it's really clever, but they 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 harmonize between the big heavy riffs. And this like clean guitar, but somehow it's mixed so well for '93, and it works really well. I mean, I say for '93, obviously you have albums like Nevermind come out, which is like one of the best produced albums ever. Yeah. But a band like this can't afford to record in a place like Nirvana. They're recording with like presumably like not as good equipment. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like when a lot of death metal bands, that's why the intro- the production is so interesting. Funny but- enough, I, f- I forgot to write down, but it, it was mastered and engineered by uh, Dave Shirk, who is the founder of Sonorous Studios, which, right. is, which is quite a legendary studio. Oh, is it? So I, mean, I meant to research that. I never got that, that, yeah, so, that bit. So they were, they, they, they've, they've done quite a few. He's been involved in mixing and engineering quite a few legendary albums in the scene, actually. I might awesome. actually try and quickly uh, get the Encyclopedia Metallum up. Yeah. The uh Well yeah, you you do that. I was uh, the 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 Thorndale um comparison. Yeah, it's like super interesting because they do this thing with the harmonies where like they do a lot of like one one of the guitars will be going up and the other will be descending and it gives you this great it's almost like looking over a, a precipice from a tall height. It makes yeah. you feel kind of un, like it's like oh, it makes your stomach drop because it doesn't go where you think it's going to go and your brain they have these harmonies where your brain naturally is like oh, this is going to go here next and it doesn't go where you want it to go. But because because the one that the, because the harmony that's descending uh, the way you don't expect it to go is the clean one and not the heavy one, it has the and it's that creepy kind of yeah like clean sugary sound like you said it's like yeah it just gives you this like uncertain feeling yeah that really plays off of a lot of these lyrics of like death and life and not knowing what's going to happen next yeah and this really hadn't been done before like you know what I mean like death metal was death metal I and like you still know. really struggle to find bands that do that now yeah really. Like the only other band that was, and not even similar, but there was a kind of like breaking similar um, kind of ground was Thurgathon. Oh, they, I still need to really dig into them. I didn't get around to it. But yeah. uh, unlike unlike um, uh, Disembowelment, they were using like kind of like the motif of like the synth and the violins to pr- to provide that additional uh, atmosphere. Whereas what's so cool about Disembowelment was they were using the other guitar to do yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, w- yeah, yeah. Which was which totally sounds, in my opinion, like 
more sinister and less like, like I was saying before, less classically gothic. Yeah. Like there's something more like, I would say this is one of the most kind of naturally mystical sounding albums, but without all the fantasy bullshit and conceptions of what mysticism is. Yeah, that, that is it. They, some, they, they somehow, they get the part of this like new, new wave, new age mysticism, which is the part of like taking your consciousness to another realm, but they do it without like dream catchers and shit. Yeah. Yeah. They do it with like, instead there's like, there's no apologies. There's no handholding. Yeah. There's just darkness and bleakness. But yeah, they still are firmly, the, the lyrics are not childish. So you were talking about, um, your prof- if you found the... Yeah, yeah. So Dave Shirks, he, he has been involved in mastering a lot of albums. So he's done albums by agrophobic, ag- agrophobic, agrophobic, agrophobic <laughs> nosebleed, Amorphous. Uh, done some albums for Bongzilla, Brutal okay. Truth. Okay. Oh, wow. He's done a lot. Then. Cephalic Carnage, no their debut way. album. Um, there's Disembowelment, of course, Exhumed, done Gore Metal, like the, that's one of their Oh, yeah, albums. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Fleshless, Flotsam and Jetsam. Oh, I love Flotsam and Jetsam. Oh, they're, they're great. great. One of the best German, thrash right? Yeah, that's it. Uh, uh, they're US, I think. Oh, they're Flotsam US. and Jetsam is... Um, oh, no, Flotsam and Jetsam. I'm getting mixed up with someone else. Yeah, yeah. Flotsam and Jetsam is Jason Newstead's yes, band right, before yes. he joined Metallica. Yeah, they are sick too. I was thinking of Assorted Heap. You ever listen to them? They're great. Oh, okay. No, I haven't. No, no. Yeah, yeah, I'll play some later. They're great. Incantation as well. I've done a lot of incantation no albums. Okay, yeah. that's cool. Okay, so this Remission. guy's... Oh, really? By Macedon. Yeah, wow, so. so this guy's got pure, like, cred oh, yeah. then. I didn't realise that he's... Uh, and this is an Australian studio? Or did he move to he's America, so, maybe? This is, so it was mastered... Well, I'm, I'm presuming because um, he's based in Arizona. So it's Sonorous okay. Mastering. Oh, okay, so maybe there's some kind of connection there with like, um, they probably got the hookup through Relapse, I guess. That yeah, pretty makes I, sense. I reckon so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I can't remember where Relapse is based, but yeah, I reckon definitely there was a hookup there because, yeah. you know, I mean, even back then, what band can afford to fly out, especially yeah, yeah, when it's your yeah. first album, to fly out to the US to yeah, you know, yeah, master yeah, yeah. it, through, get an yeah, album yeah, mastered by whatever. Yeah, yeah. a legendary... Uh, oh, damn. Yeah, so maybe they just got flown out there and recorded it all there. That's really interesting because they obviously, um, yeah, they, he said in like interviews, they like demoed the hell out of it and uh, like... But they left. They left only this album, and there's like a couple of, like, uh, like accumulated recordings of like demos and stuff, and yeah. stuff, songs they were writing that never finished, and things like this. They've, there's a couple of little things like that. But th- this is the only album they ever released. Um, but the um, your prophetic throne of ivory. So w- when I f- was first listening to this album, I imagined that I think from the point of view where he was like talking about like a lover. Yeah. Like your prophetic throne of ivory to me was like this idea of like, there's another figure in your life who you hold above other people. And again, I found it super interesting because I was talking about that thing where like no other people in this album and the lyrics have their own agency. No one is referred to directly. Yeah. They're all just like thoughts in your head. They're like relating to other people almost as objects. And I thought it was super interesting because I imagined it being your prophetic throne of ivory. It's like he's not even talking about the person. He's talking about something they own. Yeah, which yeah. is like something I found really interesting. But um, looking at the lyrics, I found something really interesting, which is the um, he refers to um, Cadmos, who was an ancient Greek hero, and he was one of the like classic first heroes ever. Um, who, yeah, here we go. Cadmus in Greek mythology was the legendary Phoenician founder of Thebes. Who he was one of the first Greek heroes alongside Perseus and Bellerophon. He was the greatest hero and slayer of monsters before the days of Heracles. Oh. So he founded this city, um, Thebes, which is like this great, um, it became like a great trade city. It was like, it was basically as big as Athens. Yeah. And it was like in the ancient days of Greece, it was this huge trading town, um, trading city. And it was very famous for its silks and its armies. Yeah. Um, and there's like great, there's like parts of the, the uh, not, not the Iliad, but there's like ancient, there's lots of like great Greek stories um, about them. And the, the lyrics of the album start to tie into like, ancient Greece, yeah. which I never realized until I was starting to look at no, this. Yeah, yeah, I never clocked that. Yeah. So he says, uh, there, is no, uh, there is no light, no day. Cadmus, your preserved brotherhood, the ivory, your only solace. In flight, we persevere into the lights of the ivory plains, structures from silence, petals in the stream, murk above the, bu- the dark moor. The east winds brush the dust from your prophetic throne in lands I, n- of I never saw. Um, I, I've like they're like beautiful poet, poetic lyrics. Um, yeah. I think uh, something I don't know if it's relevant. Um, the name Renato Galina, from what I can see, it's an Italian name. Yeah. And but I mean, I know that's Greek and he's, I don't know, maybe there's some connection with Greece. I'm not sure. Yeah. 
but I kind of wondered if maybe like he was thinking about like some kind of connection to like uh, a part like thinking about like his family being from like Europe and kind of how things were and how life kind of never got to be and how things might have been like simpler times. There's this kind of feeling. Yeah. You know, this kind of romantic looking back and like a longing yeah, yeah. for yeah. things to be like a different way. And it's like really interesting that he's looking up to this almost like statue of this Greek hero. Yeah. But it's like older than like Hercules. Yeah. I thought that was really cool. Oh, that's fucking cool. Yeah, yeah it's sick. Yeah. And it's like your prophetic throne of ivory. He's actually talking about Cadmus's throne. Yeah. You know, which is like an empty throne. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, that's Fuck. fucking cool. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's legit. Yeah. This, this is the thing. Do you know what? It's like, it's every time I listen to an album and the vocals are indecipherable, I'm always just like, ah, <laughs> oh, fuck ah, it. I'm fuck not going to bother reading that's the totally lyrics. That's totally what I did, yeah. If, if I can't, <laughs> If if I can't make out what they're saying, no. then I'm I'm just I'm not gonna bother. But it's and the thing is as well, I think this is something that I think a lot of people who grow up listening to a lot of death metal tend to do is that because most of the lyrics are pretty bog standard and mm. like you know like you just got to take them at face value. It's just like slasher fan fiction. Yeah. That like when you do come across someone who is like a legit lyricist mm. and actually is putting some thoughts and some like poetic nuances into the lyrics, then I think it's it's it always kind of takes you by surprise a bit. Mm. Yeah, and yeah, so absolutely. it's um, yeah, I totally need to go back and just like try and fucking delve into the lyrics a bit more. I'm glad you did because I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. I didn't until I was looking at it for this. I was, I was like, when I when I read that sort of stuff, I was like, whoa. Yeah. Um, it also it is is quite funny because the later song, "A Burial at Ornans," I always thought Ornan sounded like some Irish guy. Yeah. I'm going down. <laughs> I'm going down Ornans for a point. <laughs> but no, it turns out Ornan was a figure from the Bible. So yeah, I'll get into that. We might as well work our way through all the songs. But um, I love, yeah. But, but yeah, it's um. Yeah, I do you know what in this track in particular, I can really hear like the, the clear um <laughs> link to like a more modern band like Bell Witch and where they took yeah, a lot totally. their inspiration from. You know, it's those really super like mournful, clean bits before it leads into like the super doomy sections and like it's such a good guitar tone as well kind of reminds so me a bit good. of um at times the guitar tone in uh discouraged ones by catatonia yeah yeah, yeah like there's just some like just something about the way that the like the clean guitars resonate that just sounds super super mournful and i just fucking it is really fucking sad just love it so much you know another band this album sounds like who i figured must be fans just because you know the start of tree and, of tree of life and death yeah that could be an akakoka song yeah yeah yeah. the way yeah. the cymbal chokes come in the guitar tone is really similar to akakoka as well yeah yeah, yeah it's, it's really and um this is something i think about a lot when listening to music uh this kind of death doom specifically um and i, I thought about it a lot with um phlebotomized who we're also going to be covering was that there's when you're playing guitar there's like you can with doom a lot of the like stonery doom side of things um tends to go more for like fuzz for their distortion which sounds really great when you're playing big chords which a lot of doom is yeah um but a lot of these old school death doom bands had this had this tone where it's more like death metal it's tighter yeah. and you get this you get the there's a lot more um a lot more pronounced when you're playing like faster passages and stuff like yeah. that, which you just can't do with like fuzz. There's no definition really like, like fast little runs and stuff sounds yeah. shit. Like she can't hear anything. Yeah. Um, but the chords sound great, but it's just, I find it funny because I listen to like the big heavy chords on this to me still just sound so fucking heavy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like yeah. heavier than a lot of like fuzz bands or whatever. Yeah. So I kinda, yeah like it's a suppose, cause it's interesting. Isn't it? Cause I suppose maybe that, do you think that's why the HM2 sound is so popular? Cause it's like a fuzzier take on death metal. It is. Yeah. So yeah. HM2 is interesting. Cause I think that, that a lot of the HM2 kind of, uh, it, it, HM2 is a bit like it's better, but it robs you of a lot of that. Like if you do that, it does. It's, it's interesting. Cause that's like 50, 50. And that's why people love it so much. Yeah. Cause obviously it is brutal, but it's better for the lower kind of stuff. Yeah. But yeah, if you're just like tremolo picking, doing those kind of certain, like slammy thing, like it doesn't work as well in my opinion. I'm sitting yeah. here like HM2 sucks. Like it's, it's really good, but it's a different sound. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that, I think that is part of why it was yeah like so I big. Th I think definitely yeah, hundred percent right. Because like I feel like you know there's something about because uh, of how tight the musicianship is on this album and the production of the guitars. There's something because at times you know it sounds a bit more stripped back and a bit mm. more bare 
as opposed to like, you know, when you've got like something that's overly like, I associate that bigger, fuller sound with more of a commercial kind of sounds personally. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like when I hear something, cause like, you know, when you listen to all the Mora sound death metal albums, you know, like it's, it's more like this, like, you know, it's more, it is, like you yeah. said, it's, it's, it's a bit cleaner. It's, it's, <laughs> It's obviously, obviously, every, it's all still distorted, but it's more kind of like compact, and you can, you can, like you said, more pronounced. You can you pick out the notes a bit more when they're being played. Yeah, and I think you know this album is massively helped. I think by the bass as well. I think um, yeah, Matt, the, bass the bass is an unsung is, hero, is like providing a lot of the low end, and it is you know doing a good job of you know like locking in tight with the rhythm section, making sure that the drums are you know locked in tight, but while also providing the guitars, particularly the rhythm guitars, with that low end kind of support needed yeah. to kind of like boost it up yeah it's hard to know it's hard to know like who whose choice that is or if that was just like the people in the studio knowing what they were doing because obviously li looking at the list of albums that guy's done like he knows his shit oh yeah and yeah. He, he knows how to get like remission yeah like people still listen to new mastodon albums and go i wish it sounds like remission yeah like, it's how many albums later with like some of the best production available and they're still oh, yeah. like i you wish they sounded like they did on remission that still happens now yeah if you listen to like say march of the fire ants and aunts. then uh, <laughs> aunts. <laughs> fire ants aunts. match of the fire <laughs> <laughs> wow match, match of the fire ants. of the fire ants <laughs> now to like a newer mastodon track like it's night and day like yeah it is yeah like crush or destroy was the first mastodon oh. song i heard and i was like what yeah. the fuck is this yeah. <laughs> this is wild yeah right now, should we move on to the next track? The stuff that I find really interesting about this section of the album, which mm. I'm going to summarize quickly. So you've got this next track, Excoriate, which mm. is more or less a full-on death metal track. Yeah. It's definitely the most death metal track of the album. What I find interesting is, is just, and this is why I think it's always so important that bands take the time to think about how they're going to structure an album, yeah. the journey of the album. Because you've got this, and then we'll go into it in a bit more detail in a bit. Then you've got Nightside of Eden, which is basically a uh, an interlude yep. of sorts. And then the uh, uh, burial uh, ornaments, which is mm. probably the doomiest track. The doomiest track, track. The yeah, yeah, it's interesting, so like isn't it? Death metal interlude, straight Do up yeah. doom. Yeah, and it's just it makes perfect really well sense thought about. Yeah, because you're riding the high from the death metal interlude, and then you're just descending back into. And don't get me wrong, there is death metal elements still in that track. Cause yeah, I believe a burial ornaments is the longest track. That's about fourteen I think so. minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's a great track. But excoriate itself is just you know it's. The perfect time, I think, to introduce a faster tempo, you know, just like more straight up, like fucking blasting, raging track. Excore it. This is the one with the the kind of the clattering military drums, and it goes into that. <laughs> da, 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 da. It goes that like the yeah. end. It's, it's like a bit pure like a death metal band at times. Yeah, yeah, it's like death metal all the way through, and then the end is just like really like honed in, beautiful nice doomy mid-paced riff. It's really oh, good. Yeah. Yeah, that last riff, yeah, is it's it's great. It's a really good riff. Yeah, but it's um, but yeah. Once again, going back to what I was saying about the double bass, the use of the double bass gives like a real sense of kind of like oomph and like rigidness to the rhythm. Yeah, that just really keeps everything nice and tight and in place, and it just really makes you take notice because you're like, like this fucker's he's not just you know, like he's not just blasting when the rest of the band's blasting. Yeah, and I think it's just really like I said, it just just keeps you guessing. <laughs> just love it. Yeah, like it's, this is really cool, and it kind of feeds a bit into the theme. So he's. The, the lyrics are kind of, it starts off with the tree of life and death, goes into your prophetic throne of ivory where it starts to kind of approach these more kind of metaphorical kind of spaces rather than real world places. I, I think everything, it, uh, this whole album is like walking through a dreamscape, um, kind of, but then excoriate, it kind of pulls you back into reality again because excoriate, I think it means cutting off flesh. Yeah. And it's like a medical term. And the lyrics are like very just blunt and like unveil, unclothe, excoriate, decorticate, peel, divest, shred, strip and scalp your nails. Your hands hemorrhage continuously. Numbness will then follow until the pain is overwhelming. The meek suffering of thee as they watch your flesh re revel and achieve their morbid greed. It's like very, this is like the most, again, it's like, it's funny that it sounds the most death metal, but also it has the most death metal lyrics and is the most grounded in like here and now. Yeah. But then, like you were saying, it's like really interesting. The counterpoint, like they do that on purpose. Like you said, they thought about it in the album because the Night Side of Eden just goes really fucking dreamy. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> it's weird. is like the death of the person, or Mate, that's a very good point. I don't think about that. Yeah, that probably is the physical death. Eden, you got that brief bit of the re like the relief, yeah. of death. And that's a very good got... point. I never <laughs> thought about that. Because it's, it's a really nice, like, I really like the interlude. It kind of reminds me a bit of Mercury Rev at times. I don't yeah. know if you ever yeah, heard yeah. them, but they're like, they're yeah, really like... Mean. Yeah, like, like trip hop almost. Yeah. yeah, they're like a really strange, like, they get they get 
thrown under the indie label a fair amount, but they're just quite an experimental kind of like, I think they're New York based. Okay. But, I always um, assumed they were like English. But, I don't know why. It's... But say again. I, I always thought they were, thought they were English. I, I, I know they're definitely American. Whereabouts <laughs> in the States, I'm not sure. I've got New York in my head, so I'm, I'm probably wrong. But most like, most good music got, comes like, from New York, real, really. Sorry. I said most good music comes from New York. <laughs> yeah, yeah. New York, California, yeah. Uh, Tampa Bay. Yeah. But now it's um but yeah, that, that kind of feels like what's going on there. Like excoria is maybe the, the physical death. That's really interesting. Nice side of Eden is maybe the transition into the mm. afterlife and then a burial awnings is like the maybe the the harsh reality of what it actually is. Well, this 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 is what's like, this is another one where I read the lyrics and I was like, whoa! So Ornan was there was a character in the Bible, I think it's the second book of Samuel, called Ornan the Jebusite, and he is basically um, he is da, 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 da. Um, he's a guy. I think it's David. Basically, wants to buy. Uh, a space to build an altar to God. And Ornan the Jebusite owns this place, um, the threshing floor, where grain is threshed from the useless husks. Yeah. And uh, the, th the threshing floor in scripture is a place of separation and revelation, a place where the harvest was prepared by separating the grain from the useless straw for the purpose of exposing and collecting the most valuable part of the crop. So it's obviously like a... Um, there's obviously like a comparison there with the, the threshing floor and like dying and like, I don't know if it's like, cause there's not, this is the other interesting thing. This album is devoid of morality in the Christian sense of like hell and heaven. Yeah. It's a lot of, it's about dying, but it's not, you know, it's not like, oh, I've gone to hell. Yeah, yeah. And it's like the lyrics of the tree of life and death make you think maybe it's going to go that way. Cause yeah, it's yeah. talking about rotting Gothic wood and stuff like that. Yeah. But yeah, then it goes really spacey. And like, I wonder if like a burial at Ornans. So Ornans is obviously, Ornans the guy that owns the threshing floor. Yeah. So a burial at his is like, I don't know, that's really interesting. You were saying that like, it's great, it could be dying. Yeah. Like, and so like, yeah, a burial is like, maybe this is like the disposing of the body. Yeah, yeah, like the harvest of the organs. Yeah, the har like, yeah, yeah, maybe it's something like that. Yeah, because in, in Excoria, yeah, they're talking about, yeah, he's talking about, um, yeah, they uh, watch, your fresh, you watch your flesh revel and achieve their morbid greed. It's like they're wanting to own and possess the body, right? Um, yeah. So like, what's he saying in the lyrics? Of a bur a bur but it's an interesting. So it could even be that the narrative or the perspective has changed because the thing is, if that, if the, if, if you yourself have died, you've left this plane of existence. Mm. But all the misery and sorrow of the people that knew you is still going to remain in place. Mm. Right? So like they're feeling the doom and despair of having lost someone that they loved. And it, this, because this burial ornament, this is the one that starts with the really fucking depressing, like, bass notes. It's like, yeah. boo, boo. Yeah. It's so doomed. <laughs> it's so miserable and just sad and doomy. It's great. That's a really good point. I didn't make that. Um... And another interesting fact is a, a burial ornament is actually a painting. Oh, from, I didn't know that. I, haven't find, I didn't find it. Oh, that's artist called Gustave Courbet. Okay. Um, it, was a, it was a heavily criticized painting. Uh -huh. So that drew both 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 praise and fierce <laughs> denunciations from critics in the public, mm. um, because it had basically it what, what the picture is. It's I'll show it to you quickly. Please do. It's oh. like depicting like quite a realistic like burial and funeral, right. which I think at the time was seen as something. Oh, was distasteful, maybe. Yeah, very morbid. Ah, oh. and kind of yeah, distasteful. So a lot of people felt that it lacks, like the it has as here the sentimental rhetoric oh. that was expected from that like art, art period. Okay, that seems a lot more what the song's probably closer, more closely linked with what the song's about. So maybe the the biblical link is probably accidental just because of the name of the painting. But a burial ornament, that's maybe. See, I the way I kind of see it is it's it's more like the harsh reality of death. Yeah, and much in the same way the painting was just trying to uh, illustrate what a funeral procession is actually like mm. like much in the same way there's a lot of people that go through life not wanting to accept the fact that that is how that eventually uh. you know we die we leave the body and the body just decays yeah oh that's really interesting Ornans is actually just a small town in france yeah that's cool okay i didn't know that <laughs> i went down this hole but i kind of love that again like there's nothing to say that it's one way or the other i think it's a lot more likely it's to do with the painting since it's the same name but I like that you can interpret it in different ways. But yeah, that's that's really yeah, that's a really interesting um point. Another another cool thing is the lyrics of this song, he starts talking about beggars again. And again, like talking about people like they're just shapes. 
Yeah. Not real people. Not the. He's not talking about the people he loves. Yeah. He's just talking about people that have been left behind, which again is like, I think is very like to do with transcendence, you know, because it's like that, um, you know, like Dr. Manhattan sitting on the moon. Yeah. I hate, I'm so sick of the earth and these people. It's like, it's like that, right? Yeah. It's yeah. like these people are just beggars. They're nothing. Like I'm now dead. I'm a spirit. So maybe that's like, yeah, he's just like looking at them and he's just like, oh. Kind of disassociating. Almost, yeah, he's disassociating. Like, yeah. 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 Yeah, I won't. And it's funny because, like I said, like it's possible that the word the songs aren't even meant to run in order. Yeah. But the reason the reason I believe there to be an order because the next song, the spirits of the tall hills, or on dark lyrics, it's called the spirits of the tall hall. And I don't actually have the physical record, so I don't know which is right. I think it's tall hills it's because tall, I think it's hills. it says that on Spotify. Yeah. So I'm going to go with that. And yeah. I've seen that more referenced in like um, like Wikipedia's and stuff like yeah. that. But it's kind of funny because when you read the lyrics, I always think the tall hall kind of makes more sense. Um, but he talks about Thebes and Cadmos again. Oh, okay. So, so he comes back to Cadmos later mythology, in the yeah. yeah, brings it back to the Greek mythology, which I th- again is kind of interesting because it's like now, now with what you've said, it's like he's looking at his past life and now he's like, no, I want to go back towards the dreams. Yeah. This is, I don't care about that shit. I don't care about my body. Yeah. yeah. I don't care about the fact I'm dead. I want to go and. Yeah look at all this i want to look at history and these places i should have been i yeah. was like i didn't want to be a peasant when i was alive i didn't want to be a monk that believed in the wrong thing yeah you know that's fucking super interesting yeah it's it's but yeah do you know what i never really thought of this as like a concept album before i, I literally though. didn't until i started reading the lyrics yeah, so yeah i didn't make that connection with it because spirits of the tall hills is my favorite song on the album that's a great track. that it's beginning a, that yeah. beginning of that song with the double bass and the fucking it's like so dreamy and trippy if you're like it's it, this is like the the, the single <laughs> from the album if you will i don't think they ever released a single but yeah the, the, that intro is so hypnotic and really pulls you in it's beautiful and then it goes into those like discordant like (laughs) it's so good (laughs) what i like about this track is because after you had like you know excoriate and uh, a burial ornaments being like kind of like the isolated uh sort of portions of like the genre splicing that they've done this track is just like a mixture of everything again yeah like similar to like the tree of life and death like it's got like it goes full blasting mode at some point again as well. So it's got the death mode elements. Like I said, so the, some of the leads on this track are some of the best leads on the album. Yeah. Like for sure. It's just, it's just so fucking just menacing as well. This track here, when I listened to this, I could totally see a correlation between this and like Triptychon and mm. like sort of mo- monotheist era Celtic Frost as yeah. well. And it's just like, it's just got that same like, because yeah, there is there is groove on this album. And I think it's yeah, kind of there's a understated. lot of groove. Yeah, like it's, I, I it think is that's fucking, part of why could, it's so um, memorable. Yeah, and you could totally like fucking headbang to the shit and get into it, and it's just like you know, it's not all straight up like doom and gloom and misery, and it's you know, it's that groove there that really helps uh, accentuate you know the lyrical concepts and just the overall atmosphere of the album. Um, but just you know, but gives you something else to cling on to to kind of like, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just like because that I think like Monotheist is one of my favorite albums of that's all time. Great album. It's like that's I love that album so yeah. much. Um, and like yeah, just uh, that's another album where it's just fucking bleak. Yeah, and it's just like there was something about that album when I was at my darkest times. You know, there's that song on that um, on Monotheist where it's like where he's saying like no, no, um, uh. I can feel the pain coming back again or something like that. There's yeah, this yeah. like, it's like hypnotic and it's like the, the music's again, this like descending feeling and you feel like you're sinking in the mire, yeah. but you just get this feeling from Tom G. Warrior's vocals. that He's just never going to give up. Yeah. And it's like, he's, he's just like, no, I'm just going to persevere out of spite. Yeah. I just really <laughs> respect that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah no, it's, uh, I could definitely kind of resonate like that. I'm definitely got that level of a stubbornness and painness. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's just like, nah, fuck this. Yeah. It's like, this so the lyrics and um, the spirits of the tall hills, um, uh, standing upon the portal where my eyes have become weary, the cold winds from the south bring ghastly fragments of the forgotten land, where once the spirits stood along the desolate shore to disappear into the silenced murk, 
And then in speech marks it says, Some by seven gated Thebes in the land of Cadmos there, for these the end of death was misted about them. As my eyes slowly descend, the dust transcends into my frail structure. The wind, the cold wind breaks my complete silence. The portal for which I stand upon collapses. No fear shall I feel, transcendence into the peripheral. And there they have been their and there they have their dwelling place and hearts free of sorrow in the islands of the blessed by the deep swirling stream of the ocean the hypnotized sound of boeotian harps created by the force of spirits the faraway lands no longer seem so distant oh shit the nirvana-esque serenity as the hills become unclouded the spirits embrace my soul as i envision the neutral spectrum before me the harp echoes and echoes and my wings take me to the bewilderment like that the lyrics that that's all of the lyrics of that song i'm sorry to read the whole thing out but it's Again, like I think it's super interesting in the context of what we've been talking yeah. about, the theme, it potentially being like a concept album. Um, See, I think those lyrics pertain to the music as well, because like the end of this track is probably, in my opinion, like the most classically like beautiful like yeah. instrumentation of the yeah, album yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. And it just like totally matches with everything the lyrics are talking about. Yeah, because this is cool, because this is the transcendence. Yeah. This is where he's kind of looking at everything. He's in the afterlife or whatever. And this is like, yeah, the end... Is like my wings take me to the. This is like he, him ceasing to be. Yeah. You know, this is him becoming something else. Yeah. And there's yeah, there's all these references to like, and I really love that. I love this kind of romantic imagery of how he imagines almost like ancient Greece. Yeah. You know, and he's talking about like looking at the sea and the, yeah. the hills. The, the so I guess like the tall hills, and it's kind of funny because again, like when I when I used to listen to this album a lot, it was like I thought it was um, I thought it was just all gothic. So I thought like a burial ordinance was some fucking Irish guy. Yeah. And I thought the tall hills. So I was just imagining like some fucking dingy. They like I, a lot of it like, again, like I just kind of thought of it was like gothic. And I thought it was yeah. like some miserable, rainy, dark, yeah, you know, English hills, you know. But it's actually talking about like ancient Greece and the weather's beautiful. And there's like the sea, and it's kind of like what he wants. Yeah. You know, it's like this yearning. It's not, despite how fucking miserable and depressing this album is, it's all about yearning and wanting this thing you can't have. Yeah. And do you know what I mean? That's what I mean by there is an element of hope on this album. Mm. It's as thinly veiled as it is. Oh, yeah, it it's is, so thin. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking there. And I think, you know, the last track, that it makes it, oh, knowing all this, the title of the last track makes a lot more sense. Because it's right? kind <laughs> of like, you know, the, um, the mirage of it all, right? So yeah. like the cerulean transience of all my imagined shores. So maybe this is like, because they do say like, you know, when you are dying or about to die, like your brain fires off all of its neurons. At once, yeah. And you experience like, it's like it's something akin to having an acid trip. Yeah. So those that's what that DMT like, is, right? Die is it being DMT? brought back to life have experienced it at yeah. times. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I think this is why a lot of people do get, I mean, I don't want to outright say that I don't think there's an afterlife, but I think this is why I think a lot of people do strongly believe that there is one. Because yeah. when your brain is firing off those neurons, you see things and you experience in your life from beginning to end again. And it's just, you know, time becomes irrelevant. So, and I feel like, you know, the, this title track is kind of bringing things back down to earth. Yeah. It's kind of like saying, yeah, but it's all kind of within the brain, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it isn't real. That's the thing. Yeah. So. There's a great um, 2000 AD short story back in the day, like a comic. And there's this scientist and he's, he's trying, like he basically like bankrupts himself, like trying to make a time machine. Yeah. And like, basically like he spends all of this time and effort and his life just gets worse and worse. And he's like doing everything he can to make this time machine. And then he basically right at the end of the comic, he commits like his wife and family, like leave him and everything. And he ends up committing suicide by jumping off a bridge into a river. And like, as he's drowning, he sees his life flash before him and he's like, oh, I finally found the time machine. Yeah. That was cool. Oh, That's yeah, cool. it's tight, man. <laughs> yeah, it's ah. cool. But yeah. Um, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, that, so this track in particular, once again, I think similar to um, The Spirit of the Tall Hills, I feel like there is uh, a lot more kind of like beauty and uh, melody in this track. Um, and I think, you know, it's it's a great natural progression because I think the first couple of tracks are far more like just sinister and like and just really depressing, frankly. Yeah. And it kind of like, you know, you get you get your, the little death metal track. Yeah then a low and then it builds back up to like quite a climatic but yeah. also quite like your poetically beautiful end yeah i mean this album is a solid listen start to finish <sighs> uh, there's no dead tracks no. there's no filler it's all good every track is good it's like just like listening like so that's why i kind of think now it's like a concept album you can just sit and listen to the whole damn thing it's like one big track and they're yeah. like acts it's like a you know the, the only thing i think that it, it was like 
it's like interesting there's no like overture like i i kind of really find it interesting that a tree of life and death is like so grounded and small compared to but it's all it's like you know it's like you're saying with like the um like excoriate being like more of a straight ahead death metal banger yeah it's like sometimes to be a good writer for music you need to know when to pull it in to make space for you to yeah. expand out and they're so good at that they're really yeah. really good at knowing when to pull it in tight because yeah. they're about to fucking hit you with that landscape yeah in the next and I, bit and i think you know i think that's why i've always loved this album and i don't think i've ever listened to this like just one track i've always listened to it all the way through because like you know i think you've got to have that confidence in the band when you've got that clear vision to like what you said know when to rein it in and to go all out because i feel like you know with people's the way people consume music kind of like post broadband internet and streaming services and stuff it's yeah. like people don't listen to albums anymore so i feel like consciously a lot of bands are trying to incorporate all their influences and styles into every tracks song. yeah and you can't give a complete journey in every single track no. on the album it doesn't have a natural flow yeah so i feel like you know when you listen to a classic album like this and in its entirety you realize that you know that music is meant to be um a journey and meant to have you know that kind of transcendence from and meant to you know take you to another place yeah one other detail i've got to mention i forgot to mention about a barrier ornans is it does almost tr start with um um the uh the the vocalist's name, uh, renato doing like a like a death rattle sound yeah and i think yeah. it is actually mimicking like a, uh, the sound of a death rattle like the oh, vocals cool. are really interesting on this album because they're not um they're not overly distorted like a lot of like death metal where it sounds, you know, comical at times. Like they are still quite human sounding. It's like yeah. a lot of groaning, a lot of like, you know, snarling, yeah. very human <laughs> sounding um, harsh vocal techniques. Also, all of his vocals are good. His shrieks are good. His low kind of things are good. Like there's no, you don't listen to like one half of his like aggressive vocal and be like, oh, this is the best, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's all, yeah, it's very express. It's almost a bit like voices in that way. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah, that's a very good point. Um, that's that's the other problem when you when you have an album that you've like listened so much that you kind of have internalized it almost. Yeah. Is that it's like sometimes harder to pick out things like that because you it, like you just yeah yeah yeah. It's kind of easier when it's like some an album you don't know so well because you go into it and go oh well, this is my observation of this and so. yeah. yeah. Oh, I find it much easier to review albums I've listened to for the first time because mm. I'm just like because when I've got the attachment to something it's almost like I've got the blinders on at times. Totally, I've got to force myself to re-listen and look at things from almost like a different perspective. Yeah, I I, um, I had to do that with this album. And <laughs> like you know, it's, I feel like all the components of this album are so good. And like just going back to the vocals quick, like, like can you imagine if you had like John Gallagher style like death metal burps on here? Like it wouldn't work. It would. Nah take away so much from the album yeah it like it works totally for what dying feet is to yeah much the same way frank mullen's vocals work perfectly for suffocation yeah but like it's um yeah i think just think all the components of this album it's such a for, for a doom death metal album it's such a vulnerable album as well like there's yeah. so much like i think that's why it resonates with so many people because i think it's one of the first times i've heard an album that's so brutal yet vulnerable and melodic and this and then it's got all the components from what you would want from extreme music it does it really does nothing it hits everything yeah yeah that's so true i never thought about that i mean i guess there's not like like a hardcore beat down part <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no breakdown yeah, yeah there's but... no breakdowns but apart from that it's got everything else yeah, yeah. well we'll wait till for the bottom eyes. they've got everything covered yeah, with their yeah, gang yeah. Vocals. yeah the the yeah to round it up because i think we've probably i don't know how long we've done um on uh disembowelment also can i just say it's probably one of the best band names ever that's oh, a great name disembowelment it? and it's cool because the band used to style their uh, their name with they'd have like a small d it's like lowercase lower d, case d, d the and the rest of it was in caps yeah. yeah um yeah which is really cool you know what though i never thought the actual cover of this album might have ancient greek shit on it yeah because you've got the one on spotify is the is like the, the, the compilation one. they've done with the demos but you've got the orange looking cover which is the first one right yeah, I think the red one might be the original. Yeah, this one. Yeah, it's actually got fucking... Because I am... Um, I was annoyed because I... Oh, no, it's like a graveyard and shit. It's not, yeah. Oh, okay. It's not what I thought it, it was. was um, I did have the opportunity to buy this on CD once because um, uh, a lot of the record stores in London used to stock quite a lot of the relapse stuff. Yeah. Where you get all, a lot of the relapse CDs in in the big record stores. So, and I did, I did see Disembowelment once, but I don't know. I think it was... I don't know. I hadn't known... I didn't know too much about them at the time. 
dude, there's one thing I want. I need to get a copy of this on vinyl, dude. Oh, I yeah, need to hear this on vinyl on a good system. That'd be amazing. Yeah, because if it's got like, I don't know how, I don't know if they used to do separate masters for vinyl back in the day or how modern a thing that is, but I just need to hear this on vinyl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that'd be legit. But one thing um, before we wrap up, um, I was talking about that interview with, with Renato. Um, obviously, the band um, came back, as you mentioned, and formed Inverloc, but that was without Renato. As far as I can tell from this, now, I don't know what the full situation is. I don't know how much the other band members all contributed towards writing. Renato certainly makes it sound like he was in charge. I don't know if that's just because he was the vocalist and he was being interviewed at that moment in time or yeah. if that's just, you know, I, I don't know how much I'm misunderstanding so I'm, I don't want to put any words in his mouth but from reading the interview, um, there's some really interesting things he said. Um, so like I was saying before, the interview is kind of, I feel like it's a lot later on in the day for him. It's like not when the album came out, it's like many years afterwards. Yeah. And he talks about the interviewer is like, you know, Yo, you only ever released one album. He's like, was that a choice or did you want to do that? And Ren Renato says going into it, he's like, yeah, I, I knew like actively that I wouldn't want to like stay in the scene. I knew as I was recording the album that I wasn't going to do anything else. Like I wanted to leave people wanting more. Yeah. And he's like, um, oh, the metal scene's like too negative and bad energy and all this kind of stuff. Um, but something that's really interesting is he's he's kind of saying like, oh, I, I definitely made the right choice. Like definitely da 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 da. Um, but he kind of he, he mentions that as when he was in this band, he was he was in uni studying design, I think, at a degree. And he says also that his dad was really um, against him being in a band like yeah. disembowelment. So his father was like actively discouraging him from being in the band, from making music. He was like, it's a waste of time. You're wasting your time. So I wonder how much of disembowelment not existing or doing anything else was really just about Renato's family life being quite oppressive. Yeah. You know, Makes I wonder, I don't know. It could have been nothing to do with that. I don't, like I said, I don't want to put words in his mouth. I don't know. I'm sure his father's a wonderful person or whatever, but like yeah. I, I found there's too much romance on this album for it to be by a guy that doesn't really give a shit. <laughs> I can't buy it somehow. <laughs> yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's, I think it's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I feel like that has always been kind of like the curse of the metal scene and the fact that you've got potentially some of the greatest musicians and songwriters in the history of sort of heavy music that just end up fading into obscurity. Yeah, because they've got to get a fucking day job and they get responsibilities yeah. and they need to have a fucking family and then having a family, they just have no time to be in a fucking band because they're working 40 hours a week and they're crushed yeah. out of existence and they don't have time to rehearse and they don't have the money to... And yeah. it's funny because like, it's almost like the issues they had back then are probably the opposite of what there is now in the sense of how saturated the scene is. Because back then, I can't imagine there'd be much many bands in Melbourne, Australia wanting you know, to do shit like this. Yeah, I don't know. Because like, I mean, like, the Australia scene is not something I've, I've been, you know, I've not been keeping my ear to the ground that much. But, you know, every time a band pops up, like even like a sick, like sort of a brutal death metal band, like Disentomb, for example, mm. a great Australian band. Um but it's um, like, you know, back in the days in the scene, there was like, you know, you had the tape trade in, and that was the only real form of communication between yeah. these bands. Whereas now it's oversaturated. Yeah. Like you can't, you can't, if you blink twice, then there's already been another 100 death and black metal albums released. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's but just... I think um, that's kind of also what I love so much about heavy music is it's like, you know, Nietzsche had this thing about why should the artist, he was talking about like Greek plays, and he's like, why should the artist care about what the observer thinks? Yeah. You know, why should you give a fuck? What you, you no, you make your art and you live your, your reality and you live your passion yeah. and you do what you care about and you pour yourself into it and you distill yourself into your art. And if people don't like it, that's their fucking problem, yeah. you know? And that's like, this is a different thing. It's like, this, this is why, like, when people. You know, it, it's like if, if people want to be in a band and it's racist, I'm like, okay, that's what you want to do. You're telling me that with all the beauty in the world, all the beautiful people, beautiful cultures, beautiful things you could do, that's the best you could do. Yeah. That's what you're choosing to do. Okay, that's cool. I'm choosing not to listen. And that's yeah. my choice. Whatever. Go make your little fucking bullshit. Yeah. I'm going to call it out. But that's, that's the same shit. It's like there's so much you can do with art but why should you care and i kind of love that so much of the metal community like when you play a metal show i love that people 
like when I play a show with Lowen, people come up to me afterwards and they're like, dude, what's that fucking guitar effect you're using? And I know it's because they play guitar and they want to do what I was doing. And they're like, I can't figure it out, man. Yeah. And yeah, like, yeah oh, it's yeah. a blah. I do blah, blah, blah. And it's cool to f- chat to people that are passionate about that. And I'm not here like trying to hide my secrets. I'm not yeah. rehousing all my guitar pedals so no one knows what my <laughs> tricks are. You know, it's like, it's passion. Yeah. And I love sharing that passion with other people. And it's like, um, my mum's got a great saying where she says, you can't be the tallest person in a room by cutting off everyone else's head. Ah, that's great. Yeah, it's yeah. a good one, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and it's true. And it's like, I think sometimes there are like bands in the scene or whatever, and they piss you off for whatever reason. And, um, you know, being in a band is like, a, there's like some degree of it that's like naturally competitive. Um, but it's really important to remember that any success for any band in any music scene, especially the metal scene, but in, in ours, is like, it's a success. Yeah. The more people that are going to gigs, going to metal gigs, selling out metal gigs of any kind is just more people going to gigs, more people exactly. being passionate, so more I infrastructure. Don't get gatekeeping. Like I really don't understand, but it's, well, it's an interesting one because I do think that it's, um, I mean, in what sense are we talking about here? What well, the things I, I think I suppose I'm just relating this to how I grew up with the music personally because like I was saying off camera a while ago like I grew up thinking I was the only motherfucker in the, like a yeah. five mile radius yeah oh, me too that listened to death yeah metal. no one listened so, to like, metal where I grew up yeah <laughs> no one gave a shit but it's um, but like I think you know as I've gotten a bit older I've realised that you know that the best type of wisdom and knowledge you could receive is received wisdom through uh, social interactions yep. speaking to people. Yep. You know, like learn about things that are from people who are passionate about it, not shit you read out of a book. And don't get me wrong, I'm sure it is, you know, for, for example, people studying music theory, I'm sure there's a lot of information you could garner from textbooks and courses that, that will help you, um, that will massively help you in your skills. But I feel like there's something to achieve the soul of what music the voice of the soul. Doing. Yeah, <laughs> voice of the soul. Voice yeah. of the soul. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, you know, that can only be really attained through having the passion to do it. I yeah. feel like. Well, it's, it's like life experience. Yeah. Yeah, like you said, you can be like I love on um, when Big Wheel calls it on Heavy Hole, and he calls it like music school death metal. And he's like, yeah, cool, you can do your sweeps and stuff, but like, yeah. it don't hit you there. No. Nah, you yeah. know, and it's like. That's why a band like, uh, that's why everyone loves Necrophagist, yeah. right? Because like they're insanely talented and they do it in such a way where it hits you. Yeah. It's not just going to and you're yeah. like, okay. Like some bands are like that, but some bands aren't. And that's like, that technicality isn't always necessary. And like, no. sometimes I think a band's super technical. And if I ever actually sat down to try and learn their songs, I'd be like, oh, that's way more simple than I thought. And it's the passion and the way it's played and yeah. the really clever ideas and like disembowelment. It's like them going, I'm going to, bring all these new wave influences but it's still going to be the heaviest record that's ever been recorded yeah, it's so fucking insurmountably heavy yeah and you know it makes you think because it's funny because obviously you were talking a little bit about how he was done with the scene and you know they kind of just made this one album and bounced there are a lot of bands out there who only made one good album when mm. you think about it and then they've all they've been trying to do since then is to recapture the essence the of flame. that album so maybe just maybe there are some bands out there that know they've got one album of like really solid material and then that's them done. That's their legacy mm. left. Yeah. You know, like, funny, look at, like, Hathier of Flame. Perfect example. God damn, man. That's not, we need to do another one of these yeah. at some point. And they're, they're on the fucking block. That yeah. album is ridiculous. It's ridiculously good. <laughs> so I mean, good. you can argue that that's kind of their second album because most of the members were in the, the other project of Paul and Spawn yeah. beforehand. And there is definitely similarities between the music. But, like, one album as, like, like Hathier of Flame. And it was just like... God damn. It was like, what the fuck? And then, like, and then they bounced. Demolik as well released one album been touring that one album for 30 years now. yeah who gives a shit it doesn't matter right yeah yeah it's, like, it's a it's good wild. fucking album it's a good fucking album yeah but yeah why do you need to release a million out but why is there is this expectation that you've got again it's like with capitalism getting involved with art right yeah. it's like you, what there's that right that nirvana song that was like radio friendly unit shifter or whatever yeah you know they're yeah, just taking yeah. the piss out of like record as many albums like we've done never mind it's the biggest album okay here's fucking in utero yeah 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 here's some abrasive fucking noise yeah, yeah. here's a this is a song about a baby that smells like butter or whatever <laughs> <laughs> oh god swear. Yeah. buzz from melvin's is just one of the strangest lyricists that yeah, is definitely yeah. an inspiration there yeah i've I struggled with with melvin's they've got a couple of songs i like but overall i'm like i really like that uh 
hostile ambient takeover i like that album but a lot of their other stuff i'm like <laughs> yeah. never really given them much time of day they're one yeah. of those bands that are just but it's, uh, it's it's just weird you get you hear these platitudes and this inherited wisdom from other people where they're talking about you, know, you kind of take on the opinion of others because you hear what other people are saying yeah like melvin's are kind of one of those bands i was like oh i know they're good because they're everybody elder statesman is into right them. yeah i love del crover like he's cool yeah he's a great drummer like i like his shit yeah but yeah i don't know i just i just i, I don't know yeah yeah, but it's, uh, and you know, it's just like, if you look at something like the Big Four, like, you know, most of them released only a couple good albums and been peddling shit since. Right, yeah. Death yeah. Magnetic, come on. Oh, what are you doing? Dog shit. That was worse. Yeah. Oh, I'll back up what I was saying on Instagram as well. Like, St. Anger's not as bad as people make out to be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but that unnamed feeling song is bad, though. <laughs> oh, man. The, yeah, the fuck? The, <laughs> the Invisible Kid. Invisible Kid. <laughs> oh, yeah, Invisible Kid. Yeah, man. Oh, oh God. boy. Right, yeah. on that note, shall we move on to our next album in this deep dive? Mm. 